Hey Tommy, that was quite the exciting trip we took down to Tucson to review what? The new Hyundai Tucson and the new Hyundai Santa Cruz. Yep, and in this podcast, we are going to tell you everything about both cars. And guess what, Tommy? We have a special guest. We do. Yeah, I got to interview Brad, who is one of the designers of the new Santa Cruz. And so we'll do a little bit of my interview with him when we get to that. But let's get right to it. I think we need to talk about the Tucson in Tucson first, and then, of course, the Santa Cruz. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Santa Cruz, what is it, Tommy? Well, it is the new Hyundai Trucklet. I'm calling it a compact truck. They're calling it a sport adventure vehicle, <laughs> but we're going to go with a compact, I'm going to go with compact truck, you like truck lit. Um, so, but before we get and talk about that, which is super exciting because we got to kind of crawl around in it. We didn't get to drive it, but we did get to sit in it and play with it and, you know, talk about the innovative features. Let's talk about the fourth gen Tucson. Well, it's a big car for them. So apparently this is their best-selling car in the lineup. It is a compact SUV built to compete with stuff like the Toyota RAV4, the Honda CRV, the Ford Escape, the Nissan Rogue. You kind of get the idea. And for the 2022 model year, the Tucson is all new with some bold styling. Yeah, they really popped up the styling uh, weasel <laughs> and really made it much more interesting. Uh, the thing about Hyundai, of course, is that, uh, you know, every generation, uh, they kind of try to exceed the previous generation. I'm not saying other manufacturers don't do that, but Hyundai and Kia specifically do that. Uh, and there's a lot to love about the car and some things not so much. So you want to talk about the good, the bad? You want to talk about the specs first? You're the spec person. Why don't you start with that? Well, it starts about $24,950, and it goes all the way up through the, 30, high, 39. the high 30s. It comes in both gas and hybrid configuration. It will come in both front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive form, although I believe currently only the all-wheel drive options are the ones you can buy. But it's a really cool little thing. So the base engine is a 2.5-liter four-cylinder gasoline engine, but funny enough, if you get the hybrid model, it's about $1,200 more, you get 12 more MPG, and that has a 1.6 liter turbo engine with an electric system, and that one makes 226 horsepower versus 187 in the normal gas version. And coming later this summer, by the way, the uh, regular Tucson is hitting the dealerships now, but later this summer, we're gonna have a plug-in hybrid. We didn't get a chance to experience that, but we did drive the normally aspirated and the hybrid. There's also an N-Line coming, which is a sporty looking version. Let's start out with the style because it is certainly more angular, more aggressive than any of the other offerings in the segment. Now, uh, if you look behind me, you'll see kind of the Santa Cruz over my shoulder and you'll see those little running lights. Uh, those are the same running lights you're going to see in the Tucson. So it's a family kind of look now. And if you are listening in podcast form, what we're talking about is the Tucson has a blacked out grill. Yep. It's, it's like a shiny black finish, but along the edges of the grill, there's a reflective panel that hides LED running lights. So basically you've got kind of like an egg carton grill with these little squares and the squares along the edge, uh, when the car's off, they just look like more grill. But when you turn it on, those come to life and shine a bright LED. I think it's a total of eight, yeah, it's little same, blocks. It's the same thing in the, in the uh, Santa Cruz. Now, probably the most controversial thing about the design language is, of course, uh, they've done this thing that Jeep did with the Cherokee and then walked away from it that the Kona does where, you know, the big round lights are actually the running lights and the kind of uh, squinty long lights are the regular headlights. Uh, it takes a while to get used to, but if you like that sort of design language, that's where the Tucson's at. What I think is so interesting about the design of the Tucson and Chris Chapman, who is one of the design leads at Hyundai, yep. was kind of discussing its language. We did a podcast with him. If you want to listen to Chris, he did the first and second generation BMW X5. Uh, so he's, you know, got some pedigree in terms of doing pretty badass cars. And X6, and he did like the Kona. He that did was a lot his of cool, team yeah, as well. Yep. So what they were saying about the Tucson is unlike other cars that are, are supposed to look alive with, you know, the two eyes being the headlights and the grill being the mouth that is supposed to breathe. They wanted this to look very industrial. They wanted it to look like a machine rather than a living being. So the eyes are down low and they're not eyes, they're headlights. Rather than having the grill be a place for it to breathe, it's a place for it to consume air like an industrial piece of equipment. Along the edges, there's no organic shapes. It's all harsh 
angles, you know, very yeah, angular, a lot, very a lot jagged. Of lines, intersecting lines, a lot of triangles, a lot of 90 degree intersections. Uh, it's very... Um, it's like the opposite of organic. It's yeah. supposed to be very... Um, very intentionally angular and muscular. It's an interesting idea. And I think it works. For the most part, you know, I think it works. Look, that segment, right, is the most popular segment in America. So think of the RAV4, think of the CRV. These are just very popular cars right now uh, that, um, you know, it, that segment's just on fire. Uh, and it's also the most, one of the, if not the most, certainly one of the most important uh, vehicles in Hyundai's lineup because it sells the most. Uh, and it's actually pretty ballsy of them to go and basically completely redesign the car. And while there is a little bit of resemblance from the third generation, it's pretty much an all-new car. And usually manufacturers don't do that, right? They won't risk alienating current buyers in favor of new ones. Uh, and Hyundai did that. So uh, congratulations. Now, um, it's um, a much bigger car. Uh, they're saying best in class rear legroom. And I sat in the back and I was very comfortable. And I'm, you know, 6'2". And, not the smallest guy in the world. It's an interesting thing that you brought up, and maybe we should pause on that for a second. Sure. You know, when you look at the evolution of like the RAV4, there's there's kind of a direct line you can draw between each gen generation. You know, the first generation shared something in common with the second, which shared a little bit with the third, and then you can kind of see the slow progression. What Hyundai's been doing pretty much across the board is every redesigned generation is like a blank slate. And it's it's an interesting idea, a potentially a little bit risky, because there is almost no correlation between the fourth gen and the third gen. Between the third and the second gen, same thing, almost no correlation. It's like they have to reinvent the design wheel on every single new generation. Now, does that work? Well, I think it's kind of an interesting thing to, to keep the brand fresh and new, but it also means that if you're unfamiliar with the new model, you may not know it's a Hyundai. You may not understand that this is the, the lineage it's part of. Yeah, so let's talk about the program and you know, let's do a little bit behind the scenes. So we arrived in Tucson, uh, Arizona, and that first night we were there, they actually unveiled the Santa Cruz. We weren't allowed to take any pictures. And then the next day, uh, we drove uh, from uh, the hotel, uh, kind of what, what would you say, about an hour and a half? to uh, a place where they do zip lines. Exactly, yeah, it was out in the Arizona desert yep. in kind of the sandy area. And we drove the one with the 2.5 liter, not the hybrid. Yeah, we drove the, the, the normally as, naturally aspirated gas engine out first, and it was, uh, we can't talk about how it drives. Yeah, we can't, because we're gonna publish this at, at the embargo time, so we can oh. talk about driving impressions. Okay, well, it's good. It's a, it's a, it's a very nice thing to drive. Um, it's not exciting. I wouldn't call it particularly I'd, I'd engaging. Little, yeah, I would say it's a little numb. But it's I the mean, steering's it's, a little numb. You know, it's 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 almost too quiet in some ways. You're really divorced from kind of the driving experience. So if you like, I mean, I think Hyundai is really trying to make it you know very quiet and very uh, uh, refined. But to me, it came across just just a little bit numb. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't like blown away with the driving experience. It also wasn't exactly quick. Uh, you know, it, it was right down the middle in terms of kind of how it drives. It's, if you're an enthusiast, I think, you know, it's certainly not the one that I would buy. If you're looking for, you know, best-in-class legroom, tons of, you know, room behind the back seat, a lot of options. I mean, my God, this thing had a lot of options, right? Then it's certainly something I would consider. But driving experience, I, w I wasn't blown away by it. Uh, it wasn't bad. It was fine. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't engaging. It doesn't need to be though. I mean, it's a it's a small crossover. It's yeah. for folks that want to have the reliable, um, tech laden, comfortable transport to get I, them I'm, from A to B. I'm saying that you know, if I was going to go get myself one, I would just pop the twelve hundred dollars more for the hybrid because it's so much quicker. Right? Yes, it's got a lot more horsepower. It's got a lot more speed. The, the steering is still sort of numb, but at least it's got some, as Nathan would say, cojones. It's it's a very very good hybrid system. Uh, the fuel economy is just insane. I think highway is thirty nine, or is that combined? I should look that yeah, up. Why, why don't you look that up, and I'll keep talking about what we did. So we drove the you know the two point five liter non hybrid out there, uh, and then they actually had the Santa Cruz for us on display. So we got to crawl around it, uh, you know, talk to the. Uh, designer, we'll get to that in a second. And then on the way back, we got to drive uh, the hybrid version. But Tommy, you actually went zip lining. I did. I did a little <laughs> bit of zip lining. You were on this like massive swing where they tether you uh, like you know like like a pig <laughs> to a rope, and then they drag you up about four or five stories, right? And then they give you this uh, little thing you're supposed to pull on your chest, and the second you pull that, you go swinging down this massive swing and. The look on your face was priceless. I'm very proud of you that you did that. I was terrified just watching you. And give that blue one a pull. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Another man's part of the 
<laughs> Woo! It was a lot of fun. It was a, uh, a pretty cool thing to do in a program. It was just like a lunch activity. They're like, you want to go swinging on a bungee? I'm like, sure. <laughs> Why not? It looked like it hurt. So I'm looking at the uh, fuel economy. Yeah, it was a fuel economy. So the hybrid averages 37, the hybrid blue averages 38, and the standard Tucson all-wheel drive averages 26. But for $1,200, you get something like 12 MPG better, 1,250. And I want to say like, what, 80 more horsepower? I mean, the hybrid's got a lot more power. I don't think it's that much. I think Maybe it's... 50 more? Yeah, it's 187, I think 226. And, and you go from a 2.5 liter normally aspirated to a 1.6 turbo. But this is the cool part about the hybrid, is it's not a C CVT in, in any kind of traditional sense. It's actually a six-speed automatic and a set of planetary gears, um, but it drives like a six-speed auto. It drives like a, like any other normal automatic vehicle. So it doesn't have that kind of weird rubber band effect like so many of the other hybrids in the class. Yeah, so the thing that I love about the car, uh, I love the styling. I think they nailed it. I love the interior. It's just very classy. It almost it kind of, you know, it looks like a Genesis more, sorry, I shouldn't be saying that, uh, more than a, uh, uh, Hyundai. Uh, it also is very comfortable for the most part. There's tons of room, uh, but they did the one thing that it's like you, you kind of want to ask them, did you guys see what happened with Honda when they got rid of the volume and tuning knob? Did you see how much uh, love Honda got for that? And by love, I mean hate. Uh, and that's what they did. Unfortunately, uh, you know, look, I, it's such a little thing, right? When you think about it, the fact that it doesn't have a tuning knob for the radio or a volume knob. Uh, and yet, because infotainment is becoming such a crucial part of any driving experience, right? Because that's what it's about nowadays. When you lose those two things, it's hard for me to get past. Uh, I guess, you know, for me, that would be... Sorry, Hyundai, a deal, deal killer. I, I just need a volume knob. And there is a knob, it's, it's a little like... Bob, that you can toggle up and down on the steering wheel uh, if you want to do a mechanical, but the, the entire screen is all touch screen. It kind of went back to what, it's like a better version of Cadillac's old Q system, right? Which is this haptic system where when you press things, it kind of comes back. But in a moving car, I think we have learned over the last 10 years that it just doesn't work really well when you have to kind of toggle things or slide things especially when you're you know when you're going up and down and left and right it's just it's just very frustrating the entire center control stack is all touch sensitive so you've got the 10 and a quarter inch infotainment screen obviously touch screen it's similar to other Hyundai products but below that you've got like you mentioned the volume and the two knobs those are touch sensitive buttons below that you have the climate control well, there's, yeah, there's no button it's like a little well it's like it's it's like just like it's a flat panel right, and then exactly. it's a it's a little pad that you tap yeah. and then below that is the climate control and those are also all touch sensitive uh, screens yeah so it's 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 a lot of in the video, I said it didn't work very well, and of course, when I showed it in the video, it worked perfectly. So it's one of those things where, um, but when you're showing when it, you're, you're not driving, when right? you're stopped, it's easy yeah. to do. But when you're driving, it's a little bit harder to kind of pinpoint where you're trying to place your finger. I think it's going to probably be an issue, and I wouldn't be surprised if Look, in the in the facelifted version they go back to more con conventional circles and knobs and buttons. But it, we'll see it, what it you took, guys. Say. It took Honda, I think, exactly two years before they brought back the volume knob. That's how long they put up with the pain of people complaining about it. And, and you know, uh, it's interesting because when, when they did the product presentation, they said they did all these focus groups and they really listened to their customers. And maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm the crazy one here, but I have yet to talk to anybody. And let's face it, we talked to a lot of fans, we talked to a lot of people out there who just come up to us, and yet I've never talked to somebody who said, the one thing I want is no volume and tuning knob, or the one thing I want is haptic controls on my touch screen. It looks cool, it feels modern, it looks like something out of a sci-fi movie, but then when you're actually trying to use it, it becomes, I would say, uh, very frustrating very quickly. So this is a world vehicle, we should explain this too, which is pretty cool. They actually are going to be selling this vehicle all around the globe. I'm actually looking at a map right now on Wikipedia, and the interesting thing about the new fourth generation Tucson is there's two different configurations. There's the short wheelbase and the long wheelbase depending on which country you live in. And it's amazing all the places they sell it. So for example, in the US, we only get the long wheelbase. In Canada, they get the long wheelbase. In Mexico though, they get the short wheelbase. For some reason in Poland, they get the short wheelbase, 
Oh, but like big cars. Come in on. Belarus, they get the long wheelbase. They like big cars. And in Russia's long wheelbase, China's long wheelbase. Anyway, I'd love to hear from you guys. Am I just beating a dead horse here? Do you do you like the haptic controls? Maybe it's just me. Maybe that's something that that you know is something that, that you guys have gotten used to, or maybe I'm old and grumpy and it's fine. So I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, we'll read them. Love to see what you guys think about you know going back to th those kinds of. Uh, well, I'm going back. I'm going back when you look at Q, Cadillac's Q system. But I guess from uh, another point of view, you're moving ahead into a touchless, stylized, modern era of controls. I think a lot of people probably won't care. Yeah, you might be right. You might be right. Now, we did, uh, we did bypass the off-road course uh, just because, look, when manufacturers do uh, off-roading, uh, it's usually like a dirt road, and we want to test it here to see if it's an off-roader. But, but my sense is that this is probably not like a RAV4 Adventure, right, or a Bronco Sport. Uh, this is more, you know, all-wheel drive if you have inclement weather, snow, maybe on a dirt road, maybe a little bit of sand, but it's certainly not going to be something that people are going to take overlanding. It's an H-Track all-wheel drive system, so it's Hyundai's... On, on road biased. Hyundai's version. It does have some stuff going for it, though. Um, so, both the, uh, the gas version and the hybrid are normal transmissions. They're not dual clutches, which is good. Um, I, I think it might be better than you expect. Now, the off-road co course they had, I was talking to someone who did it, it was like 26 miles and it was A just... dirt road. It was too long to kind of do on this one-day program and it was all dirt roads. Well, yeah. I mean, we had a choice. We could have either gone, done that, or done the Santa Cruz. You couldn't do both. Yep, so we decided to go do the little pickup truck thing, the Santa Cruz, rather than spend 26 miles on dirt roads. But once we get it here in Colorado, we'll be sure to put it up Tombstone Hill and see how it does. I think it'll be okay, Dad. Okay. I think it'll be like a RAV4. Or, yeah, I agree. Or a RAV4 Adventure. I mean, the Adventure RAV4 is cool, but it's not any more off-road worthy in a lot of ways than like a... Uh, uh, or the TRD off-road yeah, is not more off-road than the adventure. We shouldn't hold everything through the crucible of off-roadiness, right? Well, no one's going to use it as a... Yeah, exactly. Most people use this thing as their everyday vehicle, going to work, going to the supermarket, you know, doing their shopping, uh, and just the, their everyday vehicle. And, and I think for that, uh, you know, having a capable all-wheel drive system is fantastic. So there's a bunch of different engines globally, too, um, m most of which we don't get here in the Any U.S. Any diesels? Are they still doing diesels? Um, no. You know, we're very lucky here in America, Tommy. Uh, we have the, one of the most competitive automotive markets, and while we don't get as much choice as, let's say, the Europeans do, we do get, you know, cars that are spec out to the nines, which means everything uh, at a very low price. So people here are used to getting, you know, all the bells and whistles and not paying a lot for it. Uh, and you compare that to other places in the world, and it's pretty astounding, actually, how how affordable, like like really top drawer cars are here. There are uh, some weird transmissions abroad, oh. like a six-speed manual, a six-speed clutchless manual, the seven-speed dual clutch, things that we aren't getting here in the States. Other things that are kind of cool about this, so the 2.5, the base engine, has both um, multi-port fuel injection and gasoline direct injection, depending on which RPM you're at. So it's dual injected. The 1.6 has various length valve duration, so it can change the amount of time that the valves stay open and closed to optimize for efficiency and power. It's got a lot of high-tech stuff. I think it's going to be pretty reliable. Hyundai's really been pushing their longevity, and it's got that magnificent, what is it, 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. And I think the value is pretty good. The one we were in was 37 or something for the gas, and then the hybrid was 39. And we, we've got walk-around videos, kind of a hands-on video for both of these, so go to TFL Car uh, and go to TFL Now to see those two. I think you did the hybrid, I did the regular one. Uh, the cool thing is, you know, we weren't able to do driving impressions, so if you're listening to this or watching this, you're the first to get actual driving impressions of the vehicle. It was great. I really liked it. It had that cool thing where you, when you walk up behind it, the uh, lift gate automatically opens up. Yeah. So you don't have to use the key. And my God, is it big. I remember I crawled into the back of that thing with the seats down. I could lay down at 6'2", like I said, uh, almost the whole length of my of myself. And, you know, like you could almost sleep in the back of that thing. It's pretty cool. It's very spacious. Yes, for sure. Um, I think it had a split, so, split second So which row. one would you get? If, if, you know, if it were your car, would you get the normally aspirated 2.5, the... Hybrid or the plug-in hybrid? We uh, don't know much about the plug-in hybrid. Yeah, but. I can't speak to that, but of the two I drove, definitely the hybrid is the way to go. It's not much more expensive, it's much quicker, and you get far better fuel economy. And did you like driving? Did you like how it drove? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was fine. It was pretty numb and 
you know, it wasn't wasn't, wasn't anything special, but the brake it was it wasn't gonna fall Look, it's, over. It's, it's capable, right? Yeah, it's, it's not it gonna accelerates quickly. It's got it brakes. brakes well. It steers well. It's just not you know you're not gonna be uh, you know flogging it around your favorite. Uh, uh, hills and mountains because that's not what the d vehicle is designed to do. And there's also a sense of like uh, safety. So Hyundai said they are going with the vehicle for the highest safety ratings, which is the, uh, what is it? It's the plus, right? It's the highest one. So it has to have good headlights. It has to, of course, have offset crash testing. And, and I, I think they'll do it. I, I have high hopes that this vehicle will be extremely safe. So if you're looking for something safe, once it's completely crash tested, we'll have that up on TFL Car and let you know what the rating is. But um, I think it'll get the plus rating. There's also the Hyundai Digital Key, which is neat. It's a phone as key technology, so you've got an app on your phone with all your credentials plugged in. Keep your phone in your pocket and you can uh, pull it out. I don't know if you have to pull it. No, I think you can use it with Bluetooth on. As long as your Bluetooth is enabled on your phone, you can actually use the phone as the key to the vehicle so you can get in it and start it up and drive it along. and and never need the traditional That's key one of phone. my favorite features that the, our Tesla Model Y has. Uh, when it works, I love it. <laughs> it works 99% of the time. <laughs> I got like 90%. The app has to be running on my phone for some reason, otherwise I walk up to it and it doesn't do it. But as long as the app is running, you but should be good feature. to go. It's a cool feature. I think people have their phones with them all the time and it's one less thing you have to carry in your pocket or purse. Uh, and then uh, I, I also thought that the interior design was very beautiful. I think that the uh, seats were comfortable. Uh, well, we have an issue with ours, but that might be a pre-production, so we won't go into it. The back seats were comfortable. Uh, I like the look of the vehicle. Uh, it just felt uh, like, you know, a premium vehicle that you're getting at. Well, okay, I shouldn't say you're getting at a bargain basement price, right? Once upon a time, Hyundai with their warranty and with their, um, with their vehicles certainly was the entry level um, most value-oriented brand. But now, you know, at 38, 39,000, you're going to be, you know, at the same level that a CRV or high-end RAV4 is going to be. So you're not, you're not really saving much. The one thing you are getting is, you know, all the safety gear, right? Yep, so, you get all the safety gear. Well, you know, like autonomous braking, blindside monitoring, lane keep. You know, anything that that uh, uh, that you can think of, uh, where most, uh, you know, rear passenger occupant alert. Uh, autonomous rear alert and braking, right? If you're going to, you know, run over the kid behind you who you didn't see. All that comes standard on the vehicle, and I think that's wonderful, Tommy. I, I, I applaud the manufacturers for doing that, uh, and I think the it's gotten to the point now where the companies that don't offer that as standard, and I'm talking to you, domestic car manufacturers, you're going to have to start supplying that because it's going to start hurting your market share. I think people really want that stuff, especially you know when it comes to like life-saving technology. So should we move on to the? Hell yeah, let's go. Let's talk about the Santa Cruz. I've been dying. Chomping at the bit to talk about this. It was five years ago that this thing got unveiled in Detroit. Actually, six years ago, Tommy. Yeah. Seems like forever ago. Now, the Santa Cruz, in essence, is a small, unibody, compact pickup truck. That they're calling a sports adventure vehicle. If you are listening to the podcast instead of watching it on YouTube, the front end is pretty similar to the Tucson. So it's got a very similar grill design. But they're different. Well, what they did, and I was talking to Brad about this, and, and we'll, we'll play that interview here in a second, but what they did is, is they used it as inspiration, but nothing is interchangeable. So there's no parts apart from like the, uh, the dashboard mounts, like the rear view mirror, uh, that's, that's similar between the Tucson and the Santa yeah. Cruz. So even though at a first glance you're like, oh, it's got the same front end, it does not have the same front end. It's more angular, it's a little bit more aggressive than the Tucson but the overall language is pretty similar. Yeah, so in case you're wondering what this is, I mean, the closest thing to it right now would be the old Subaru Baja, right? Maybe an El Camino, but an El Camino had, you know, uh, didn't have four-seater, right? It was a two-door with like a full-size bed. I, I believe some El Caminos actually had super long beds. This has a four-foot bed with the tailgate making it, what, five feet? If you are looking for like a size comparison, overall length is somewhere around 17 inches shorter than a Tacoma. It's about 14 inches shorter than a Ridgeline. And it's um, uh, about uh, 10 inches shorter than a Frontier. So it's a really small little trucklet. I'm calling it a trucklet because 
It's still a four-door. It's a crew cab, if you will, unibody. Um, and it does have some more capabilities than like the Tucson in terms of open air hauling, but it's not necessarily a true body on frame, what you'd consider a pickup truck. So let's talk about the good, okay? So, uh, you know, this was designed in California by Brad. Uh, should we play the interview right now? Let's play a little bit of that interview right now. So from a design perspective, we wanted to create something that um, uh, highlighted the contrast that uh, its environment um, sort of portrays, right? So we imagine this vehicle because of its footprint, it's gonna be in dense urban environments. It's gonna allow you to thrive in those environments because it is a smaller footprint, but it's also gonna encourage uh, an escape to the outdoors as well. And that contrast of environments drove sort of the overall aesthetic of the vehicle. Yeah. So from its proportions all the way down to its details, we were trying to convey that contrast and that, uh, that, that, those origins. So let me ask you this question, right? I, I posed this in our little video. Is it a sport adventure vehicle? Is it a compact pickup or is it a ute? It's, it's honestly whatever you want to call okay. it. And right. I think that that's, that's fair for the customer and, and the, the viewer to, to call it whatever they want. We've chosen sport adventure vehicle because we felt like that term was most suited to the vehicle, but it doesn't really matter. It's a Hyundai Santa Cruz. So yeah, like I said, the, the, the whole vehicle um, kind of embodies this contrast and this duality that we were speaking about. Uh, but starting at the front, it was important to us to create a front end that didn't, uh, you couldn't recognize as a traditional pickup. So doing that, um, we've got uh, the really bold bumper and front grille. Um, we're also utilizing the hidden lamp technology that we have on both the Sonata, the current Tucson. So you've got this one-way chrome finish that the DRLs then shine through, um, giving the front end a really modern but, but also tough appearance. In terms of the overall architecture of the front, there's a lot of, uh, again, contrast in the big, powerful volumes, and then you contrast that volume with really sharp precision edges. So let's talk about the bed. So composite, yeah. right? So you've got composite yeah. material. Composite material. Um, and yeah, just, you know, the bed is, is essentially, it's not exactly, but essentially four foot by four foot. Um, the height of the, the wheel wells uh, was intentionally designed so that when the, the tailgate is in its half open position, you've got essentially a flat load floor from this edge to the upper part of the wheel wells, allowing you to carry four by eight sheets. Um, inside the bed, we've got um, the inner bed uh, compartment that's completely weatherproof. Um, so you can, you know, keep this. It also has a drain so you can keep your, uh, you know, drinks, ice, anything like that, or, you know, the wetsuit after surfing. So it's not kind of being rolling around the tailgate of the truck or the, the bed of the truck. Um, we've also got kind of side storage compartments, available um, power in the right side. And tie downs. And tie downs, yeah, a bunch of different, this, this cleat system um, that can go up and down and be adjusted to anywhere you need. And then we also have fixed uh, D-rings. All right, and tell me about this kind of tonneau uh, cover that disappears into uh, the back of the truck. Yeah, so the tonneau cover is, is optional, comes on, uh, comes standard with any vehicle with the activity package uh, or above. Um, so yeah, it's a standard feature. We felt it was important based on the research. A lot of people are potentially coming out of uh, SUVs and CUVs when they are looking in to purchase this vehicle and security is, is very important to them. Um, so that was important to offer a feature like that. The tonneau cover can be removed um, if you wanted a bit more space and to easier haul mountain bikes, several mountain bikes if yeah. you wanted to. So, so you said you have a Ducati Desert Sled, does it yeah. fit? That's a, that's, a, that's a kind of a dual sport. Like right. Your motorcycle. I haven't tried the Ducati yeah. Desert Sled, but my Husqvarna 350 does okay. with, without right. the tonneau cover. All right, cool. Yeah. So th there you have it from one of the designers. So that kind of gives you, you know, what they were thinking about. But think about this as kind of your beach uh, surfing vehicle, right? Uh, it's uh, a truck glut for uh, the urban truck buyer, right? Uh, the problem with most trucks, even mid-sized trucks, is they've gotten so big. I mean, you know, a Tacoma now is just a really big vehicle and forget about full size or heavy duty trucks but this is the kind of truck that you could actually fit in your garage because it's about the same length maybe a little bit longer than a, you know a crossover would be uh, and so you know if you if you're looking for hauling like big tall plants or mulch or you know maybe some stuff in the back uh, it's perfect if you're actually looking to put like well, he said he could put his dirt bike in there, but you couldn't put my dirt bike in there. It would just be too long. If you put it at an angle, if you put uh, it sideways. 
You don't think so? Mm. No, I have a KTM 690. It barely fit. I just drove it, wrote it I just brought it back from. Yeah, but uh, that bike is huge. It's the size of an elephant. I don't know why it's so in, in, with massive. With the tailgate down, it barely fit into the TRX, which is a standard five and a half foot bed. Plus, you had to use the tailgate. This thing's going to have a five foot bed with the tailgate down. It would. It would. It would be a monster. It'd be like hanging squeeze. over with one wheel. I think you could probably, if you put it in sideways, make it happen. Anyway, you know, it's and, and the coolest thing about it is, and I saw this for the first time in the Cybertruck. It's got this like roll up tonneau cover, right? So you can actually enclose the space and I never did get a full answer they said it was mainly waterproof it's an integrated tonneau cover and it's not they said they told me it was an actually a factory installed yes. thing and it's removable with nine bolts if you want it to be but you, you buy it from the factory and like you said it's it's like a little corrugated um, roll up roll up sheet and then you pull it out you can lock it up yep. and tailgate locks and it's nice and secure. Which solves that problem. Like let's say you're going to pick up some friends at an airport and it's raining and you can't put their luggage in the back because the, the, the vehicle is full. Now you've got a, you know, hopefully a secure place to put them. You also have like in the ridge line, this little underneath storage unit, right? It's maybe it'll hold, what would you say? How big is that? Like maybe, you know, uh, 12, two, two 12 packs of beer, right? That's how big that under the bed space would be. It's not as big as the ridge line. The ridge line, you know, you could get into almost. It's a trunk. So yeah. it's got a trunk underneath the bed. The bed panel folds up. It's got a composite bed. And then there's a cubby underneath. It's much, like you mentioned, shallower than the Honda. And that's because the Honda has a, a cubby for the spare tire there. Yeah, whereas the uh, Santa Cruz has a spare tire underneath. Which so they, is, they couldn't have made it as deep. Yeah, but that's also good because let's say you do have a short dirt bike, like your monkey. Your monkey would fit in this thing, right? Yeah, for if, sure. If you threw the monkey in there and you got a flat tire and the tire was under the bed, when I say under the bed, I mean, you know, on top, you know. How you about get, we use this in the trunk? In the trunk, yeah, or by the trunk, then you would have to take the monkey out to get. With this one, it's just like a regular truck tire. It's underneath. You just, you know, wheel it down from there and, and change your tire and away you go without removing whatever's in the bed. Yep, and then uh, that's also lockable as well. So the, the cubby underneath the bed is lockable. It's got a dampened tailgate, we were told. Um, and should we go into the oh, powertrains Oh, a and bit? the one we had didn't have it, but the rear window also goes down. Nope, it slides. Slides down, that's why I said nope, also goes. it slides sideways. Oh, slides sideways. It's but gonna it's, be it's, like a regular, it's, so the, the Tundra, the whole window slides down, and this, just part of the window is gonna slide open. left and right. So one thing that's worth noting though is, so some of like the, you know, weird other trucklets in the past, like the Baja and right. the Avalanche, They've had a removable bulkhead, so there's either been like a cubby that you yeah, can no, you can't remove open, or, or there's a place you can slide really long items, and you can't do that in the Santa Cruz. So this is, um, let's, well, let, I'll let you do that, you're much better at this, but let's talk, there's two powertrains, and you can get it in two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, or all-wheel drive, so let's talk about that. The entry-level powertrain is the naturally aspirated 2.5-liter four-cylinder with horsepower ratings of about 190 and torque ratings of about 180 pound-feet of torque. The same one in the Tucson. The optional engine is a 2.5-liter turbocharged engine, so same displacement but with a turbo, and that pumps out 275 horsepower or thereabouts and 310 pound-feet of torque, which is a huge amount of horsepower for a little itty-bitty truck. Yeah, and now here's where it gets a little interesting. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, the thing about little trucks, of course, is that they're trucks, and trucks usually go off-road. So I think this one we're going to hold to a higher standard than we did the Tucson. So if you do want to go off-road, the one you want is the entry level for two main reasons. First of all, neither the entry level or well, the smaller engine or the bigger engines have a, have a low range, so you're not going to get that. So, um, you know, you're going to have to make do with kind of a ridgeline all-wheel drive power setup, powertrain setup. But the, uh, the smaller of the two engines comes with an eight-speed automatic with a torque converter, which is good off-road. But the bigger engine comes with what, on, what Tommy? Uh, a dual Andre. clutch. I, I'm doing trucks. I'm calling it Andre. Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> you know. You've only known me for 24 years. Exactly, I know. Um, the bigger engine with more power has a dual clutch transmission. Yes. So eight-speed conventional transmission in the entry-level engine, eight-speed dual clutch transmission in the big engine. And like in the Sorento that we recently tested, uh, the dual clutch did overheat. And for the most part, every time we've tested dual clutches, uh, they don't do really well. So what I like to say is in our testing and in my experience, if you want to go off-road, uh, you know, the best transmission is an automatic. Uh, you may dispute that, but it's just a lot easier, followed by a manual transmission, followed by a CVT, followed by a dual clutch. Now, dual clutches are phenomenal transmissions. Basically, you know, they have the next gear ready and waiting 
while the first gear is engaged. And especially on a track, there is nothing better than a dual clutch. But in stop and go traffic and off road, uh, they can be kind of herky jerky and they can overheat. Well, now, hold up there. What? Big news on this front, actually. Okay, let's hear it. So the Previous dual clutches we've taken off-road in Hyundai and Kia that have overheated, yep. not this dual clutch. Also in the Ridgeline. But, no. The Ridgeline all-wheel drive overheated, not the, not the dual clutch, because it didn't have a low range. Well, that one that one was different. That was actually that a, was a torque. Speed, yeah. That was a torque converter transmission that overheated. But, th you just threw me away. I don't know what that was. That I've, let, let me get back on my train of thought, because this is very important. Yep. The dual clutch in like the Seltos that overheated, yep. and the Kona, yep. and the Sorento, is a dry dual clutch. This is a wet dual clutch. This is a wet dual clutch. So this is a new transmission uh, that they've developed for vehicles like the Veloster N. So oh. it's supposed to be better. And they say that it survived their 29 mile off-road torture test without overheating. So well, we'll see what, what that means. I'm hoping you're right. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be rooting for it to not overheat. I'm going to be rooting for it to work off-road. The other reason you may want the uh, smaller engine is because of tires and wheels. Let's talk about that. There's an 18 inch tire option and a, sorry, an 18 inch wheel option and a 20 inch wheel option. So the 18 inch will in theory allow you to put a bigger tire on it. Which More is sidewall, which is, you know, better. Better for four wheel drive. And um, towing numbers are worse on the small engine, or they're the same size engine, or worse on the entry level 25. So it's 3,500 pounds on the base one, and then 5,000 pounds if you get the turbo. Now I was talking to uh, Hyundai, our friends at Hyundai, and they may actually give us one or uh, you know, lend us one for a year actually to um, do a long-term test on, and I'd be super excited for that. I think this is a very significant vehicle. Uh, you know, right now, as you probably know, if you're listening to this, trucks are red hot. Uh, and this solves a problem that uh, most wannabe truck owners have. And that is, you know, how do I own a trucklet or a ute or, a, you know, compact truck and still live in a city? And let's face it, most people live in cities. Uh, so this is kind of that, you know, perfect solution. I think it'll actually sell really well. You know, the Baja uh, didn't exactly knocked the socks off of people when it came out and now they're super popular and maybe that was just a question of timing Tommy you know if, if the Baja were around right now maybe it would do much better uh, and we'll see uh, this this segment's heating up right I, I think you can't talk about the Santa Cruz without mentioning the Maverick there's going to be a new Ford truck rumored that's going to be in the same size um, oh we have segment. pictures of it but we I have mean, really it, good pictures it, officially it. it doesn't exist. Ford doesn't. <laughs> Ford won't acknowledge its existence, even though we've seen like photo shoots of it going on. We don't really know much about that. We're thinking it's going to be based on the Bronco Sport, which is the little baby Bronco. Um, now, one cool thing about these unibody trucks, and we see it in the in the Ridgeline, and we see it in the Santa Cruz, is really, really, really impressive payload numbers. So the amount of stuff you can haul in the yeah, truck. Yeah, this thing has badass payload, man. So the bed is, is not crazy, 660 pounds, which should be enough for most people. But apparently overall vehicle payload is 1,700 is what they were telling yeah. us. Yeah, and for all of you guys and gals who want to go overlanding, that is phenomenal. That means you could put a massive rooftop tent on this thing and bring your big ass dog, <laughs> bring your, bring your uh, Bernese mountain dog and not go over payload, uh, which is, you know, pretty cool and potentially, you know, tow a small trailer with it. To keep that in perspective, a lot of full size trucks like F-150 size trucks do not have 1,700 pounds of, of payload. And the Ridgeline is also high. The one we had was 1,543, which was also very impressive. Keep in mind, most midsize trucks are gonna be in like the high hundreds, like the 950 range, maybe the low thousand pound range. So 1,700 pounds is a pretty incredible if that's really what it's going to have. So interior wise, it's almost identical to that in the Tucson. Yeah, it's basically um, much, much, much similar to the Tucson. I, I do love uh, one thing, and we forgot to mention this on the Tucson. It has a push button transmission, which I'm not in love with as well. Uh, but this one, they put a regular old, like, you know, traditional stock, right, that you pull back to put into drive. And I love that. Uh, it just feels so good to have a truck where you actually don't push a button down or don't turn a rotary dial, but actually take a real. Uh, you know, knob and pull it. Uh, the other cool thing about it is it's got a lot of back seat room, you know. Uh, oftentimes the problem with any mid-size truck is that that rear seat is uh, too upright, right? Because there's a bulkhead right there. This one actually is pushed back enough that you can feet, sit, sit comfortably in the back seat uh, and not feel like you're, you know, in a Lutheran church from 1850. That's right. It's very good. Uh uh, space in the back and the rear seat cushions fold up 
just like you would find... And there's a little cubby there for storing. Exactly, yeah. Half of it's taken up by the jack, but the other half is a cubby. Just like you would find on uh, other pickup trucks. And am, am I wrong, but is there a volume knob in this thing, actually? There was a volume knob. No. no? No, there's no volume knob. You sure? Yeah, I'm, looking thought... at, I'm looking at the pictures. There's buttons. Is it the same thing to touch? Same yeah. It's, as a Tucson? It's, it's the same center stack. It's very yeah. similar. It's got the uh, digital instrument cluster as well. The seats look very, very similar. Um, it's, uh, it's a very similar interior to what you'd find in the SUV version. <laughs> yeah. Even the base model? Do we have like interior pictures of the base model? I don't have interior pictures. Ah, we see. only had the So, so we're, we're thinking, um, okay, the other things for off-roading, we, we will take it off-roading. Departure angle looks good, breakover is going to be okay. Uh, approach is not good, it's got this kind of chin that kind of, you know, juts out. Uh, in the front of it uh, and then of course there's no real protection underneath it so there's no real cladding so if you're going to go some hard off-roading like boulder bashing this is probably not the right vehicle but you know in this picture that we have up here where it's running kind of a typical uh, Arizona desert road I think it'll be perfect for that and I can't wait dude to put on some like ATs on it right because the tires it comes with are are very similar to those that you would see on many crossovers. They're just all seasons, and I want to put some beefier ATs. I was looking at the space like between the front tire and the front fender. It doesn't look like it can actually do much of a lift on it, uh, especially with the 20s. Maybe with the 18s, there's a little bit of room. I don't, I'm not sure, but you know, it's independent, suspend, independent front and rear suspension, notoriously hard to lift. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure it's going to be easily liftable, but I think just throwing some, you know, big old like knobby ATs would make it so much, uh, so much better. At looking good? No, at actually being, you know, the most important thing this you can is do off-road is, 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 is a tire. This is not an off-roader. It's like the Ridgeline. It's just, it doesn't have the, the, I'm, the, I'm not, the basic equipment. I'm not going to go there yet. I'm going to try it out. I think if you get the traditional transmission with the smaller engine and the taller tires, I think it'll be actually really good. But it doesn't have a locking diff? No. It doesn't have a rear locking diff? No. I think it's the similar oil drive system that's in the... Uh, Tucson, so it's got a single, I mean, it's basically an open rear diff. It doesn't have the trick like double clutch like in the, the Ford. It doesn't have underbody protection. It's got independent front suspension all around. It's got a pretty long front end for uh, approach angle. I don't think it's, it's not really meant to be an off-roader. It's, it's meant, it's it's meant, meant to, to get you to some of the cool campsites, but if you need to go um, into the high 12,000 foot area where you're climbing rocks, you, it's not really built for that. Yeah, but neither is like the, uh, I don't know, the RAV4 Adventure. Right? And it doesn't do well at it. it it's not, the that's not the a good... The Bronco Sport did really But that well. has underbody protection, it's got recovery points, it's got that locking rear diff. It's yeah, got the recovery the, points, I think they should have done recovery points. I think it would have given it... You know, recovery points, whether you use them or not, uh, first of all, they're incredibly useful when you need them. <laughs> Right. I mean, incredibly. Without them, you're like, oh my God, how do I get? I always. I'll give you. I'll give you an example of that. I was uh, a couple of years ago. I was driving up over Loveland Pass in the middle of winter, and this guy in. I think it was a Mexican Versa, right? It was from a Mexican place. Had lost control and gone careening into a snowbank. Mm. You know, and I have this Raptor with this winch on it. I'm like. Perfect. I'll be happy to get you out. I felt bad. The guys from Mexico. You know, sn snow is not something that is prevalent as far as I know in Mexico so I was like I'm gonna rescue this dude and then I had no place to hook on the winch it yeah. would have been like that it would have taken exactly like four minutes and it was freaking cold and night and blizzardy and in four minutes I could have had him out of there with no recovery points there was nowhere I could hook that winch to that would not damage the vehicle by pulling it out of the snowbank I mean you know you could put it around the rear axle maybe you might pull out the suspension I don't know depends I, how hard it's stuck in the snowbank I think that um the like we talked about the wet dual clutch is going to be better off than the dry i'm really hoping that's the case um, and i think that the normal automatic will be okay and i, I think it's going to have a similar capability to like a um, like a raf4 or tucson but i don't think it's going to it's not intended to be a well it's a dirt road dirt road well, cruiser it's not it's gonna, a, it's going to be interesting because ford isn't going to you know the one thing about ford and trucks is they do not allow people to get ahead of them when it comes to any kind of a truck right ford is about the most competitive company slash person I've ever known when it comes to their truck market uh, and so Ford is going to go after this market you know seriously and they're going to go after it with all-wheel drive you know I think this one may be more of the urban trucklet right for the guy who wants the surfboard but I, I have no doubt that the Maverick is going to be more um, um, well off-road worthy and more traditionally trucky.
And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a new uh, Baja either. I think we could see a new... That whole class is going to heat up. New offering from Subaru as well. I think uh, um, Stellantis, formerly FCA, has some stuff abroad which they sell, little little truck things. So I think we're going to see kind of a new introduction of a class yeah, the, the of Toro. compact. You guys, have, have you driven the Fiat Toro? That's a pretty cool little truckler too. There you go. Uh, and you know, the reason for that is because, look, uh, trucks have gotten so massive over the last 10 years, right? Yeah. Like uh, a current Ranger is the size of an F-150 from maybe two generations ago. Mm. Uh, and so there's this huge now space underneath a midsize truck. I know it's not midsize, it's just called that. Uh, that is currently sitting empty. And I think, uh, you know, Hyundai has the first mover advantage here, but I think uh, given this time next year, there's going to be a lot of choice. The other great thing about this is we don't know pricing, we don't know fuel economy. We do know availability, which will be this summer sometimes, right? So it's going to come out sometime this summer, but they're going to be affordable. Uh, trucks have gotten so crazy expensive, right? It's it's now not uncommon to have a full size truck at over 50k, and if you really want to push it, you know you can get into like the TRX territory, or dare I say it, the Hummer EV territory, where you're well over 100,000. I think it's going to hopefully start about 26 and go to. 40. Yeah, I bet. I bet you that's about right. 26 like to 40 in my same. bet. Mm -hmm. So that's what, I, uh, that's what I'm guessing on. But uh, let us know what you guys think it's going to cost. And it's also going to come in these uh, three kind of, you know what's become really hot right now? Our Defender is kind of this pastel earth tone blue, right? Think of these primary colors that have been like this color. It's called, I think it's called the sage, right? Basically, you look at like, like earth tones that have been made pastel that have been really toned down. Those colors are really red hot right now, uh, and the Hyundai is going to come in three of them. Uh, you look at Defender. Defender is really the first one that started pushing those kind of really cool, kind of earthy colors. Uh, and I think it's going to make a big statement when it's going to have a vehicle like that. You know, the other, the other thing that this is going to compete with, let's think about that, right? Right now, it's going to compete with nothing. Directly. Well, but people will cross shop it with the Ridgeline. But I think I think the, I think the company that's going to have the greatest competition from this is Subaru. Uh, I think yeah. this is aimed directly at like the Outback or the Forester. I think I think th that would be the person who I would see buying this. If you're looking at a Forester, or if you're looking at an Outback, maybe even a Crosstrek, if you're at a price point that's low enough, uh, this is basically you know the kind of a very similar kind of buyer you know, who's probably younger, who's, you know, adventure oriented, who's outdoorsy and who wants something that expresses that about themselves uh, and is still affordable and gets good fuel economy and yet is fun to drive. Well, let us know what you guys think of the little Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Yeah, for sure. We're going to... It's not even that little, you know, when you're next to it. It's got a lot of room presence. Well, compared to like Gladiator, it's pretty little. Are you, let me ask you, you're, you know, you're in that millennial. Are you tempted by this? No, I have no need for a pickup truck. Really? If, if you were buying a pickup truck, if you, I know you don't love big pickup trucks that you think they're really hard to park, which is true, like the Raptor, the TRX, these are you know not fun things to park. W would this be something that you would be interested in or would you look at something like you know a base Wrangler? That, that, that's, um, I, I still don't see the comparison there. I'm, I looking, think I'm looking at, if, so if look. you were in the, if I was someone in the market for a pickup truck, uh, because I, I had like a, like a, I was a biker or I, I had like a little gardening side side gig I was doing, I would probably go with a Tacoma. I think you can probably get more usability for, for a bigger vehicle, but um, I, I don't think a Tacoma or a Frontier is all that big. And I think that would be probably a better size. I think this is going to appeal to someone who's going to be cross shopping it with like an SUV and, and be like, well, I can get a Santa Cruz, get a little bit more versatility. But I don't think it's going to appeal to the traditional truck buyer. Fair enough. You know, I tend to believe that people cross shop more based on budget. I don't think anybody goes to a dealership and says, let me think now. I want a mid-size crossover, so I'm going to cross shop the CRV versus a RAV4 versus the Tucson. You da 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 da, right? Yeah. I think they go in there and say, I've got twenty-five thousand dollars. Here's what I want. Here's what I need. Uh, and you know, oh, that's a cool color. Uh, and so you know, they may walk in getting a Tucson, but they may leave with a Santa Cruz. I just think that's how people are. Uh, and if it's got kind of that fun, cool, you know, flavor, which it does, I think it'll do really well. Um, I, but I do appreciate your opinion. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think if, no. If I you're think a traditional it's, truck guy or gal, this may not this may not do it for you. This is going to have its audience, and I think it's going to be a very big audience, and it's going to be people that are really excited about the prospect of owning a 
a more versatile vehicle than their SUV, and I think it's probably going to sell more than the Ridgeline. I think it looks better than the Ridgeline. I think it's better valued than the Ridgeline in some ways if it's going to be mid to high 20s. So yeah, I definitely see the appeal here. I just don't think that someone who has a need for a pickup is going to take a serious look at this as an option. Yeah, and let's put some numbers behind that. So, you know, the, the Tacoma is right now the best-selling mid-size truck. It sells well over a quarter million units, right? every year. Uh, if you're looking at the Ridgeline, which is the, I don't know if it's the least selling, the Frontier may be that now it's old, but they sell like between 50 and 60,000 units. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you've got Ford Ranger at about 100 and going up 1,000 units. Same thing with the uh, Colorado Canyon Twins. So how many units do you think in that spectrum from like Ridgeline to Tacoma, how many of these things will they sell a year? You think they can sell 50,000 of them? Yeah, I think they're going to sell 75,000. I think it's going to be really popular. And do you think it'll cannibalize like Tucson sales or will it, like, like, like I said, you think it'll like cannibalize like Subaru Outback or, or I don't know, Trailblazer, pick, pick your crossover that you like. I have no idea. Hmm. None at all. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. And I hope we get one, Hyundai, if, if it's possible, we'd love to get one for for a long-term review. It's a very important vehicle. Uh, you know, a TFL truck uh, is the largest truck outlet, I think, in America right now, thanks to Andre and Nathan and, you know, Kent's, all their hard work. Uh, and so um, I think we need to get our hands on it because, you know, you can call it a sport adventure vehicle, but this is a truck. It's got a bed uh, and let's face it, it's a truck. Yeah, well, uh, be sure to stay tuned. We've got a lot more coming. Yep. And thanks for uh, hanging with us for this uh, very special episode of uh, the Tucson and Santa Cruz. And remember, if you want to look at these things, uh, head on over to TFL Car or TFL Now, where we've got complete walk around reviews. And thank you once again to Hyundai uh, for inviting us and for getting us uh, the chance to drive the Tucson and get our hands and feet, because I got the thing dirty. You know, I crawled up there for that. I felt so bad. I crawled up there in the bed to do a thumbnail for the video. And my shoes were filthy and it was a black bed and it looked like, you know, it looked like some uh, um, wild animal had gotten loose <laughs> in the bed after I got down. Yeah, because it was, it was like dusty and yeah. That's okay though. They cleaned it out right away. The guy had no problem. <laughs> so thank you very much, Hyundai, for putting up with our shenanigans. As always, this is Roman. Yep, and Tommy, we'll see you guys next time. Ciao.